name is Stephen Capaldo of ICAD Unity Ministries in North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to continue and conclude uh, Sermon on the Mount. Um, before we do that, we would just like to give you praise, Father, for this beautiful day and the love and prosperity you share with us and the people who listen to these messages. We ask that your blessings will be upon the message. We ask that you will meet the people listening where they're at, you know what their needs are, that you will grant what it is they need. You know what they need even before they pray, before we pray. You know what we need, and we ask that you meet those needs the way you always do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, chapter 6, uh, which is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Jesus is giving some uh, some comparisons with what, what the old was saying and now what the new is, because I was teaching in one of the other lessons that God gives us different forms of obedience, like we believe in the same God all the way through the Bible, and who God is and what he is. We believe the same all the way through the Bible, that never changes, but in different time periods with different people, he gives us different ways to obey, different formats or models of obedience. So Jesus here is contrasting the old with the new, is that you know now there's going to be uh, uh, like a, a, a different uh, uh, paradigm, if you want to use that word, but a, like a, a different format for obedience compared with the old uh, the, the laws of the Old Testament. The laws of the Old Testament were good for the Old Testament, but now there's going to be a slightly different uh, revelation and a different way of looking at obedience. We're still called to be obedient, but the form changes with with time, right? With time and different uh, different people. Uh, Always the same God, and we always believe in the same characteristics uh, regarding God. That never changes. Uh, so, six, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, And you must regularly pay close attention not to do your righteousness in front of people in order to be seen by them. Now, you might do your righteousness in front of people, but what's the motivation? The good deeds. What's the motivation of these deeds? Is it in order to be seen by them? And that, that really, you know, if you want to put it in the way that kids like to put it, that doesn't count. You know, that's, as far as God's concerned, that's kind of something you're doing for your own reputation. That's something that you're doing for the gratification of your own ego and your own flesh. So in God's, uh, on God's uh, scoreboard, that one doesn't register. That one doesn't, that one doesn't count when you, you do things in order to be seen by others. Otherwise, you do not have a reward from your Father, the one in the heavens. Therefore, when you would do charitable giving, do not trumpet before yourself, as the hypocrites are doing in the synagogues and in the alleys, for in this way they have received praise by people. You're not looking for praise by people. Uh, you're, you're looking uh, to bring glory to God. That's what really you're trying to do. You're, if you receive praise from people, be very careful when people start to praise you. Because sooner or later they're probably looking for something for themselves. So just be very, very careful. You want to bring glory to God. That's why you give. You want to obey in love. And the motivation for the giving should be the love you have for God. Truly I say to you, they are receiving their reward. These, these uh, phony people. But when you make a charitable gift... Your left hand must not know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't you know? Do it discreetly. Don't do it in in in, in front of other people. Don't don't uh, you know? Don't uh, make sure that absolutely everybody knows that you're giving. That's that's the that's the idiom or metaphor. The left hand must not know what your right hand is doing. So that your charitable giving, and that's the mindset for giving, right? Charitable, gracious, generous. Not tithing, unless you want to. I mean, that's up to you, but tithing is, is different. It's, this is giving. Would be in secret. <clears throat> so that your charitable giving would be in secret, then your father, the one who sees in secret, will give back to you. So just keep it between you and God. You know, not everybody has to know every good thing you've ever done. Uh, this idea of getting credit, this is, this is a very ugly characteristic of the human ego. Got to get the credit. You know, people have to know it came from me. I did it. I'm responsible for it. Look at me. What a good boy am I? You know, this is not. This is not of God. You know, I know that's you and me and everyone else. But that's. I'm telling you, that's not of God. When it's you know, what a good boy am I? You know, look at look at these great things I'm doing. And when you would pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray in the synagogues and standing on the street corners so that they would be revealed to people. And that's the, you know, that, that people want to be seen doing that, right? Truly I say to you, they're receiving their reward. 
But when you would pray, you must go into your secret room. Now, it doesn't have to be a physical secret room, but just privately, really, just away from the crowd, right? Your secret room, and after you lock your door, which you could be, you could be physically locking the door, or you could just be blocking out distractions. You know, think, think creatively too. It does everything. Everyone wants to think, you know, literal and concrete. You know, sometimes in literature, and the Bible is the ultimate piece of literature. You have things that are not, not only intended to be taken literally. You have to kind of think conceptually, think, you know, in images, and you know, what is it trying to teach me? You know, you don't have to worry just, you know, what, am I literally going and locking the door, right? And after you lock your door, pray to your father, to the one in secret, in secret, because you don't see him, you're alone with him. Then your father, the one who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you should not babble, as the heathens, so you shouldn't say illogical things in the language you speak, and you should not speak gibberish of a language that you don't understand. Okay? I think, I think we know what we're talking about here. Uh, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Therefore you should not be like them, for your Father knows what need you have before you ask Him. Therefore you must be praying in this way. Uh, and now I'm going to read a version of the Lord's Prayer, which I think in, in uh, may, uh, some of the wording will sound a little bit different to you, but it's, it, it is the Lord's Prayer. Our, fa our Father who is in the heavens, your name must at once be made holy. Your kingdom must now come, in other words, the way we think now. Your will must be done right now, as in heaven also on earth. You must now give us today the things necessary for our existence, right? You know, it's, it's when God has a plan for you, he's got a calling for you, he has an obligation to, to uh, supply for that, right? You must right now forgive our sins for us in the same manner as we've completed forgiving everyone of everything, big and little, against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but you must now rescue us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Father, who is in the heavens, in the heavenly realm, your name must at once be made holy. So that's, that, that's a categorical command, right? Your name must at once be made holy. goes back to the Ten Commandments, right? And this is Matthew. Your kingdom must now come. In other words, Jesus is teaching. You know, the kingdom is here already. You know, it's, it's, it's being reborn of the Spirit and, and, and loving and serving, right? Your will must be done right now, as in heaven also on earth. This is what God wants. He wants it from heaven. He wants you to do his will on earth. You must now give us today the things necessary for our existence. Supply, right? You must right now forgive our sins for us which he does, in the same manner as we have completed forgiving everyone of everything, big and little, against us. So you forgive someone else and God forgives you. You're making it impossible for God to forgive you if you won't forgive someone else. His nature and character is to forgive. If you won't, then he can't look at that unforgiveness and say that it, that should be forgiven. You know, it's got to, that unforgiveness on your part has to become forgiveness, and then God can say yes. You are, you are forgiven as well. And do not lead us into temptation, or trials, but you must now rescue us from the evil one. It's, it, it doesn't say that there won't be temptations, but don't lead us there into those trials without giving us what we need to be rescued from the evil one. That's, that's really, I think, a, a closer to what it means in English. Uh, but you must now rescue us. Do not lead us into temptation unless you rescue us from the evil one. It, but it's an unusual way of uh, using the word but in English. But I think if you translated it more as uh, unless or without rescuing us from the evil one, I think it makes, makes more sense what it's really trying to say in English. For yours is the kingdom, Father, yours. What, who, what, what do you have? Who are you? you? You are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So be it. For if you would forgive all other people their transgressions, you know, what they've done that separates them from God, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you would not forgive all other people, neither would your Father forgive your sins. You just, you can't ask God to act contrary to his nature to forgive what is not forgiven by you. That's, he'd be forgiving something that, that is not forgiveness. He's contradicting his nature if you ask him to do that. So you have to forgive, and then automatically he forgives. And when you would fast... Do not become sad, gloomy like the hypocrites, for they render their faces so that fasting would be revealed to people. 
Truly I say to you, they are receiving their reward. And Jesus always comes back, they're receiving their reward. You know, God knows what they did. He's dealing with them. Let God deal with them. You don't deal with them. God will deal with them. So, you know, fasting, oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, look what I'm doing. I haven't eaten in three days. And it, the thing is, it might not even be physical fasting. You know, it's just as likely he's talking about fasting from uh, lusts or, you know, fasting from certain things that separate you from God. You know, it could be taken in that sense as well. But, you know, the, the people will do some, uh, perform some ritual and then, you know, go tell someone. You know, this is what I'm doing. Look, look at look at how holy I am. And this is the mentality that absolutely, you know, Jesus doesn't want people to have, is that they, they've got to get credit, you know. You've got to feed the human ego with credit for these works, you know. But when you fast, you must anoint your head and wash your face. In other words, you know, take care of yourself. Clean yourself up, you know. Don't make yourself look like a slob just because you're not eating, right? I mean, that's uh, you, when you let yourself go because you're fasting, you're trying to draw attention to the fact that you're fasting, to try to make yourself look holy. No, when you're fasting, you know, you still go around with a smile on your face. Okay, so you feel hunger pangs in your stomach, you know, so what? You know, wash your face, anoint your world, you know, do whatever it is that you do to get ready for your day. And, you know, just, uh, you know, just, just act like it's a normal day, just that, because you should be uh, counted as joy that, you know, you're, you're, you're fasting, whether it's from food or something else. Count it all as joy. Right? Anoint your head and wash your face, so that you would not reveal fasting to men, but to your father in secret. Then your father, the one who sees in secret, will reward you. So in other words, if you do good secretly, then the father in secret can reward you. He rewards you spiritually. He rewards you with, you know, maybe some, some other things in, in life, you know, more concrete things. But uh, the good deeds, you know, you don't, you don't run out and tell everyone when you do something, something that is of God, because the telling of someone makes it not of God. Right? It could be something that otherwise it's of God, but you're running around bragging, then it's not of God. Do not gather treasures on the earth for yourselves, where moth and rust are destroying, and where thieves break in and steal. So don't accumulate, don't hoard wealth and assets, but build up treasures for yourselves in heaven, in heaven, in the kingdom of heaven, in the word of God, through faith, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and do not steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. So if your treasure is in the Word of God, then your heart will be in the Word of God, and that's how you'll, you'll live your life. That's how you'll uh, uh, establish your activities. So that'll be the foundation for your life. If your treasure is the Word of God, then that's, you know, that'll, that'll be seen, that will be reflected. The eye is the lamp of the body, therefore if your eye would be healthy, your whole body will be light. But if your eye would be evil, your whole body will be darkness. And it's interesting, in Hebrew there is an idiom, uh, the, the evil eye in Hebrew, um, usually in Western languages we think of the evil eye as, you know, you're kind, of, uh, you're, you're kind of staring at someone in a very ominous way to try to make them afraid of something, this, the stink eye sometimes they call it. But in, in the Hebrew language, uh, apparently this evil eye, it means more like you are greedy, uh, like you're withholding from other people. So if your eye is greedy and you want to hoard wealth for yourselves, then that's darkness. And, and he said in the previous passage, do not gather treasures on the earth for yourselves. So don't have that evil eye of lusting after things that you can accumulate for yourself, because that's darkness. Therefore, if the light which is in you is dark, how great must the darkness be? So you're trying to be light, but if really you have this evil eye of greed, you really have darkness, and how great is the darkness uh, when someone thinks that they're in the light, right? No one is able to serve two masters, right? God, the kingdom of darkness. For he will hate the one and will love the other. For he will be devoted to one and he will despise the other. Spiritually, you don't have a choice. It's one or the other. You're with God or not with God. There's not a halfway. There's not a halfway house. In, in certain things of the world, you know, you can go into these gray areas. You can do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But on spiritual matters, with respect to the Word of God, either you're following the Word of God or you're not. Either you're reborn of the Spirit or you're not. You're obeying in love or you're not. It's, the Spirit is, uh, there's only plus or minus. There's no, there's no, nothing else. You know, there's nothing, the gray areas of human existence don't exist in God's world. You are not to serve God 
you're not able to serve God and wealth. Serve, serve wealth. Don't serve wealth. It doesn't mean don't have anything. It means don't serve wealth. Serve God. Do <coughs> what God has for you. Fulfill his calling on your life. And you do that by not serving wealth, rather you serve God. Because of this I say to you, stop being anxious for your life. Don't worry. Don't fret. Worry, worry will make you sick. It's all part of, you know, fear and anxiety and what you would eat or what you would drink or what you would put on your body. So don't be, uh, don't be worried that you won't have eat or drink or clothing. Don't be worried, you know, that you have to, uh, you know, be kind of paranoid about everything having to do with eat or drink. You know, be sensible about what you eat or drink, but don't be paranoid about what you eat or drink. Don't be worried that you're not going to have enough to eat or drink. And don't be worried that you're not going to have enough clothing. Uh, or don't, you know, don't get obsessed with clothing. No, indeed, is life not more than food? And the body more than clothing, and we have to all remind ourselves because we all we all like to look nice, we all like to eat nice things, and uh, sometimes if we eat too many of the things that we like to eat, we can't get into the clothes that we'd like to get into. You know, you just have to find the right balance in life. You know, it, it's it, it, you know, just treat these areas of life with godly respect. Right? You must consider the birds of the sky that do not sow, and do not harvest, and do not gather into a storehouse, and your Heavenly Father feeds them. See, these guys, they don't do anything if God takes care of them. So, are you not worth more than they? If he takes care of these, these, these birds, you know, the, 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 you know basically they, they don't work in the way that humans understand work. They, you know, they do their own thing, but they don't sow, they don't harvest, they don't gather into a storehouse. They're not part of a productive human economy. Your father feeds them anyway. Are you not worth more than they? And who of you, if you are anxious, if you're worried, fearful, is able to add one single hour upon his age? No, if you're anxious, you'll probably take away hours more, more, more than likely. I mean, if you if you live in worry, you probably will live less than the, God, the days that God has for you. God has a certain number of days for all of us. You can probably reduce those by worrying. You're probably not going to add. Then you probably will subtract. And concerning clothing, why are you anxious? You must observe the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not labor and they do not spin. And, you know, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not worried about clothing, right? But I say to you that Solomon, in all his glory, did not dress himself as one of these. In other words, he had much, uh, you know, he had, he had uh, very fine clothes. You know, he wasn't sort of like the naked lily, right? And if God clothes the grass of the field this way, naked, which is here today and tomorrow is cast into a furnace, will he not much more clothe you, little faiths? So he takes care, he let, you know, the, the, the grass is fine not wearing clothes, the lilies are fine not wearing clothes, you're a human, and how much more is he going to clothe you than he clothes these, uh, the, these other things, right? Than he clothes nature. I mean, he'll clothe you more. Therefore, you should not be anxious, saying, what could we eat, or what could we drink, or what should we wear? For the heathens, the unbelievers, are striving for all these things. They're worried about all these things, of not having enough especially. For indeed, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But you must continually seek first the kingdom of God, the things of God, the word of God, and his righteousness, good deeds, obeying in love, reborn of the Spirit. Then all these things will be provided for you. So God's the source. You believe. He provides. And he is obligated to provide because there's a calling on your life. And you need supply for the calling. So he has to supply for the calling. And the more obedient you are, the more he can supply. The less obedient you are, you know, the more you are limiting what he can supply. You're limiting what he can supply. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow. In other words, today. Live for today. Tomorrow will be anxious of itself. And what does that mean? It will, tomorrow will take care of itself. Huh? Do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious of itself. Each day's trouble is enough for that day. You know, whatever the issue is, it doesn't even necessarily have to be big trouble, but whatever the issue is of that day, just keep your eye on that. That's, that's what you have to concern yourself with. That's what you have to deal with, what's in front of you today. And every tomorrow becomes today. 
So whatever is there in front of you today, that's what you concern yourself with. That's where you bring in the Word of God, you know, to that situation today. Whatever the trouble is, whatever the issue is, whatever the question is, you bring the Word of God in today and apply it to that situation. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Father, for watching over us and giving us the Word and giving us an opportunity to study and, uh, and fellowship through the Word, to be, be together in this, in this medium of communication. We, we pray that this, blessing, uh, this message will be a blessing to those who will hear it, um, and that uh, it will help fortify and edify uh, all of us as we go out into the world to, to execute the Great Commission. We ask that uh, your blessings be with uh, Echad and New Hope and South India, Pastor Francis, and all of those that uh, we work with and uh, come across in our daily lives and daily ministry. And we thank you for your love and prosperity and abundance, everything you do for us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Betsy.